There's a great book that I uh, recently listened to uh, titled The Secret Life of an Unlikely Convert by a woman named Rosalie Butterfield. She tells the story about how she came to faith in Jesus. She was a, a professor at Syracuse University, and she wrote an article to uh, the local newspaper, for the local newspaper, uh, criticizing evangelical Christianity. Now, you can imagine uh, that that got quite the response from both sides. There were uh, people who loved what she had to say, and there were people who absolutely hated what she had to say. And so uh, one day, uh, she was going through all the letters that she received in the mail, her, her fan mail and her hate mail, and she decided to get two shoe boxes and to put uh, them in each of the boxes according to whether they were supporters or hate mail. And so uh, she was doing that, and she came across one letter that she just didn't know what to do with. Clearly, uh, the article disagreed uh, with the, the person who wrote this letter, who happened to be a local pastor uh, in the area, but the letter was characterized with such kindness all throughout the entire letter that she couldn't put it in the hate mail shoebox either. And so uh, it sat there, and uh, she saw it, several days in a row and kind of thought about how kind the letter was, even though it was disagreeing with what she had to say in the article. And finally, she decided to reach out to the man, and they set up a time to meet for coffee, and the entire conversation was filled with so much kindness and so much grace that even though they didn't agree, they ended up becoming really good friends. And she became really good friends uh, with his wife as well. And over the years, their friendship and the kindness that this couple ex exuded to her uh, helped her become a follower of Jesus. So much so that several years later, she wrote a book uh, entitled uh, The Secret Life of an Unlikely Convert. We live in an age where uh, kindness oftentimes is underrated. But the truth is, is that kindness is powerful. But uh, again, we can, we can underestimate it or underrate it. Sometimes we, we think of kindness as something cheesy, like a cheesy smile or maybe a, a firm handshake. Uh, or we've watered it down so much that there's really nothing remarkable about it. But to understand biblical kindness is to understand its power. It's to understand that kindness really is and should be remarkable. We live in an age that's characterized by harshness and sarcasm and exploiting other people's weaknesses and, and piling on. And so uh, when we express a Christ-like kindness to other people, perhaps especially when we express that to people who disagree with us or believe uh, nothing that we believe, that is something that stands out. That's something that is remarkable. And really, kindness is the key to showing Christ love. In fact, that's the big idea of today's message. Kindness is key. We're in week three of our series, uh, Love Is, where we've been looking at the famous chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. This is a chapter where God tells us, where God defines what love is. And we've seen so far that love is of primary importance. You, you can say really that nothing really matters without love. It doesn't matter how gifted you are. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how great of a church you're a part of or how much of the Bible you know or don't know. know. Without love, it is all meaningless. And Paul, who wrote 1 Corinthians 13 and uh, verse 4, begins to get specific with what love is and what love isn't. And, and Pastor Ted did a great job last week of sharing that love is patient. And I don't think it's an accident that Paul starts with love is patient because that's probably the hardest thing for many of us. I know that's true for me to be patient, especially with people that disagree with me or that frustrate me. And, and so that's a message that I'm going to go back to and listen to again. And I'd encourage you to as well if patience is something that you might struggle with. But Paul doesn't stop with patience. He continues on in 1 Corinthians 4 and says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, 
always perseveres. In reading this, we can't help but notice that love is very active. There are 15 verbs in this very short chapter. Love is not this wishy-washy feeling. It's uh, this proactive action that we show towards other people. In today's message, my hope is that we can unwrap why kindness really is the key in showing Christ love. And while we go through this message, I want all of us to be pondering and asking ourselves a a question, a question that I've been asking myself for several weeks now. And the question is, would other people label me as a kind person? And and when I say that, I'm, I'm talking about ask yourself about yourself, not about me, right? Like, would other people label you as a kind person, not would they label me as a kind person? Unless you have strong feelings about it, you can share that with me. Uh, afterwards. So the reason that kindness is key for us as Christ followers is because it gives us an opportunity to earn trust and influence in other people's lives. Jesus told us that he wants us to go out and to be the, the light of the world. He told us that we are his ambassadors, which means that we are representatives of him to the world around us. And so when we show the world his patience and his kindness, We are building a relationship with them, allowing God's light to shine into their lives as we share his truth with them. When we share truth without kindness, which unfortunately isn't all that uncommon in today's day and age, we can be rest assured that that truth won't be received well. But when we live lives of kindness towards others, the chances of people at least listening to what we have to say go up exponentially. And one way that we could put this would be to say that kindness makes you more attractive. Lots of people are trying all kinds of different things to to get more attractive, but Alexander McLaren, who was a British pastor in the 1800s, even way back then, I think he got it right when he said kindness makes a person attractive. And so if you're single out there, and I, I can't imagine myself, I'm so thankful that I've been married for 19 years Uh, because I don't have to do the dating thing nowadays because it seems like it's all done online. Some of you are on Christian Mingle or whatever websites that you're on uh, trying to find a a date. And so if you're in that boat, if that's where you are in this stage of life, don't put how much money you make or how big your biceps are or put pictures of yourself without a shirt. Don't do that. Please don't do that. Uh, Put on your profile, I am kind. You're going to get a lot more likes. Uh, Now, you have to actually go out and actually be kind in order for it to work, but uh, that is my advice. But I am kind. Now, now kindness makes a person attractive, and, and I think we know this is true instinctively, not just romantically, but the reality is is that we're drawn towards people who are kind. And I think that's true because uh, we are all created in God's image, and the Bible tells us that God is kind, and because we're created in his image, when we are being kind, we are reflecting him in a very tangible way, which draws people in. Not everyone, but it draws people in. God is a God who draws people toward himself. Even in our post-Christian uh, culture that we live in, our post-Christian uh, country, and our post-Christian world that we live in, today, right now, a- as we gather here at C3 in Willing, West Virginia, there are billions of people around the world and millions of people right here in this post-Christian country who are gathered to, to worship God in-, in response to his grace and his mercy and his love and his kindness that leads to repentance. They are gathered to worship him. And so as we represent Jesus to the world around us and to our our families and our friends and our our neighbors and the people in our workplace and on our social media platforms, we need to represent him in a way that he wants to be represented, not in the way that sometimes we represent him. We, We need to love Uh, God and love others with the love that God, the way that God defines love, not the way that we often define love. And that's a love that is marked with kindness. This morning, I want to look at Jesus's kindness through the eyes of a parable that he shared. In Luke chapter 10, uh, we start off by reading an interaction that Jesus had. It says, on one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus 
Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this guy already knew the answer, and Jesus knew that. And so knowing that, he, he replies, what is written in the law? How, how do you read it? And he, the, the man, answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as you love yourself. The two most important commandments that God has ever given us. And Jesus says, good job. You get the gold star. You got the right answer. You answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. And the conversation could have ended right there and we could have wrapped up the sermon and gone to a, an early brunch this morning. But we're not done yet. In verse 29, it says that the man wanted to justify himself. And so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And I'm sure the man wanted Jesus to say, your neighbor is the people that you're most comfortable hanging out with. Your, your neighbor are, are the people that look like you, act like you, vote like you, the, the people that, that you're comfortable being around, and all those other people that are different than you, that are uncomfortable than you, that make you, you know, kind of like, I don't want to be around them. You can just kind of discard them and, and don't worry about them. But Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus gives us this parable instead. Now, before we jump into the parable, I do want to make sure that you know it's good for you to enjoy and to be kind and to love the people that you do enjoy being around, the people that you are closest to. As we talked about earlier in the service, it's so important for us to connect uh, with a, a few others in particular so that we can celebrate with each other during the good times and so that we can support and encourage and help each other during life's difficult seasons. It's so important to have those people. And that's why it's important to connect to a community like this. But those of you who are blessed to have those few people in your life, you know that uh, it's not that difficult to love people who love you well. It, it just isn't that hard, is it? You, you can only give yourself so many pats on the back for loving people who love you back. And Jesus says the same thing in Luke chapter 6, where he says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. In other words, loving people who love you back isn't that hard. And then he continues, and if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. And so if I do something good for you, but I expect the favor to be returned, it's not that big of a deal. If I Venmo you some money, but I expect that you're going to Venmo me that money back, you know, what kind of sacrifice did I actually make? And then he says in verse 35, but love your enemies, do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward, reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. How much more impactful is love and kindness when given to those who have never been kind to us and most likely never will in the future. We, we all have people like that in our, our lives, don't we? Maybe uh, they're somebody that you run into at work or at the coffee shop. Maybe they're acquaintances, or maybe you've never met them before at all, but they treat you in such a way that you're thinking to yourself, what, what have I done to them, right? Why, why are they treating me this way? Now, granted, they might be having a bad day or a bad week or maybe even a, a bad year, but you can't help but wonder, why are they treating me like this? I, I've done nothing to them. I, I, I hardly even know them. Have you ever had those thoughts about people? Those people, the, the ones who make you think those thoughts are the very people we are being commanded to be kind towards, but not just to be kind towards them, to be generous to them as well. So keep that in your mind as we go back to Luke 10 and we finish the parable that Jesus shares. So the man asked the question, who is my neighbor? And he gets into the parable and he says, it says, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by 
on the other side. And so here's this religious man who had dedicated his life to serving God, and he sees this man in front of him that's in need, a tangible opportunity to help, to show the kindness of God. And what does he do? He sidesteps him and continues on his way. The parable continues. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. He saw him and he said, not today. You know, I I just don't have time. I'm looking at my to-do list. I have too much to do. And he kept on going on his way. Now, a a Levite was an assistant to the the priest. He would help the priest with the religious services uh, in the temple. And so the Levite and the priest, here's two men who have dedicated their life to to knowing about God's law, about loving God and loving people and and serving others, and they see a man that's in need, and they keep on walking. Then we see in verse 33, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. A, A Samaritan, of, of all people, someone who hated Jews, and, and, and the Jews hated the Samaritans. The, the Samaritans and the Jews, they had this long history. They were often considered to be half Jewish by ethnicity, and, and they had a ton of differences, cultural differences, religious differences, and we see repeatedly in the New Testament that the Jews would be walking, and they would come towards the city of Samaria, and because they didn't want anything to do with the Samaritans, they would walk way out of their way just to avoid those dirty, evil Samaritans. That was the attitude that they had toward them. But this Samaritan was traveling down the road, and he saw a man who was beaten and left half to dead, probably a man who probably didn't have good feelings towards Samaritans, but he took pity on him anyways. And so here's my question. Why did the priest and the Levite not stop? If anybody should have stopped, you would think it would be the religious people, right? Like they they study all about God's love and all about God's kindness. Why didn't they stop? And I'm Sure, we could come up with all kinds of excuses and reasons why we wouldn't stop. And, you know, maybe they had a service to get to. Maybe they had all kinds of other people that they could help uh, have a larger impact if they went. And we could come up with all kinds of reasons. But I think the reason was, was because even though they knew all about God's love and God's kindness, they hadn't made practicing kindness a habit. And what is true of them is often true of us as well. Kindness takes work and intentionality. This is oftentimes most true with the people that we know the best, isn't it? Have you ever asked yourself the question, you know, why can't I be as kind to the people that I love as I am to total strangers? You know, you walk into a store, you go up to a coffee shop, and there's all these pleasantries that are that are exchanged, you know, how are you? I'm good, thank you, have a good day, thank you, no, thank you, my pleasure, no, it's my pleasure, have a wonderful day, and, and we leave, and, and, and then we get around the people that we're closest to that we love the most, and we just aren't as loving as we are or as kind as we are to those complete strangers. You know, maybe, maybe that happened on the way to church today. <laughs> you know, you're with your spouse or with your kids, and and you're frustrated, and, and you're, you know, you're, you're kind of having a fight, and you're saying some unkind words, or you're maybe thinking some unkind thoughts, and then you walk through the door into the atrium, and it's, God bless, how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much. Life is so good, right? And we've, if it didn't happen today, I'm sure that it's happened at one point or another. And I think the reason that that happens is because the longer that we're around somebody, the more comfortable we are with them, the more relaxed we are. Kind of like George and Taylor in the video to start the service, giving each other a hard time. They, they know each other so well that they can, they can do that. But the more relaxed we are, uh, the less intentional we become, and the less intentional we are, the less likely we are to show the characteristics that God wants us to grow in, including kindness. Kindness takes intentionality. And so if you were to ask me, Adam, you know, what's your best advice on how I can become 
more kind. I would say to look for every opportunity, every interaction with every single person that you encounter, whether you know them really well or you don't know them at all, look at that as an opportunity to practice kindness. And the more that you practice it, the more natural that it will become. But it takes intentionality. And knowing that at times we're going to have bad days and we're going to have bad weeks and bad seasons of life. And there's going to be some things that we say or do or post on social media that aren't very kind. And when we make that mistake, by God's grace, we get back up again and we continue to practice kindness. And the more that we do it, the more natural it becomes. It becomes a part of our character. It'll always take intentionality, but It'll be more natural. We'll we'll find ourselves doing and saying kind things without even having to think about it because we're becoming more and more like Jesus by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit that's working within us. You don't become a kind person by coming and listening to a a 30-minute message on kindness. You, You don't become a kind person by memorizing some Bible verses about what it means to be kind. The priest and the Levites and and many of us longtime Christ followers, we know that love is patient. We, We know that love is kind. We have some of those scriptures memorized. Many of us, we we call ourselves Christians, and and we're eager to share God's truth with others and to let the world know what we believe, but too often we don't show God's loving kindness as we share those things. And, And when we do that, in large part, it's because it's not a part of our character yet. We know about it, but we haven't let it sink down into the core of who we are. We haven't practiced it intentionally to where it actually becomes a part of who we are. The same was true for the, the priest and the Levite, but thankfully the Samaritan had made kindness a habit. And so in Luke 10, verse 34, we read more about the kindness that he shows. It says that he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. In other words, I'm not only going to be generous with my time, but I'm going to be generous with my resources as well. And in verse 36, Jesus asked the expert of the law this question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And this guy hated Samaritan so much that he couldn't even bring himself to say the, the Samaritan, right? And so instead, he says, the one who had mercy on him. In other words, the one who was kind to him. And Jesus looks at him and says, go and do likewise. The Samaritan was kind with his time and with what he had. And if we're going to show kindness, the kindness of Christ to the world around us, we need to be kind with our time and our resources as well. Now, we don't know where the Samaritan was going. He might have been on vacation. He might have been on a, a business trip. Uh, he might have, uh, you know, doing, going somewhere to, to, to be, be with his friends or whatever it may be. We don't know where he was going exactly, but we do know that he was willing to be interrupted, and he stopped, and it wasn't just for a moment or two. It, the, the scripture says the next day he gave the innkeeper the two denarii, and so this was a true sacrifice that he was willing to make for a complete stranger. Now, time is one of the best ways that we can show uh, kindness to others, and, and for many of you, time is so valuable. And if you're anything like me, you like to get stuff done, and you like to get it done as efficiently and as effectively uh, as possible, and you hate to be interrupted. It, it can be a struggle, can it? We, we don't like to be interrupted. We have a, a to-do list and nothing, absolutely nothing, not even a tangible opportunity to help someone that's in need is going to get in our way. For, for many of us, being generous with others, especially those who have never been generous to us, and we know they're most likely never going to be generous to us in, in the future, that's a difficult thing to do, isn't it? 
Our, our pastor says that the Samaritan paid for the hotel, but he said, if there's anything else that he needs, I'll come back and I'll give you extra money tomorrow. I'm, I'm going to take care of it all. You know, we've been commanded to not only love people that are easy to love, but to, to love our enemies, people that aren't easy to get along with, people that frustrate us, people that look and act and vote differently than we do, people that will never be able to pay us back. That's a hard thing. A, a few months ago, I was reading uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, and in that chapter, Israel is about to enter into the promised land. And, and so you can imagine the promised land is over here, and, and there's millions of Israelites over here, and, and Moses is in the middle, and Moses is telling the Israelites what they need to do in order to be successful uh, when they go into the promised land. It's a, a beautiful passage, but I was thinking about it, and I've been thinking about it since I read it, what might be communicated to us if we were in similar circumstances here in the 21st century in America? And I, what I believe God is telling us today is when you go into the promised land, when you have houses and nice furniture and you can go to Hobby Lobby and decorate your house exactly how you want, and when you post, post it on Pinterest and on Instagram and you start doing nice things to be able to invite people to your house, which is a beautiful thing to do, and there's nothing wrong with that, but when you have all these blessings, when you have enough money that you can go get a $5 coffee from Starbucks, right, and you have this beautiful house and animals and a land that is producing harvest after harvest after harvest, like our C3 community garden, when you have all that prosperity, as an individual, as a family, as a church, as a country, when you have all that prosperity, don't forget about me. Don't, don't forget about the one who has given it all to you. Don't forget about the commands that I have given you to, to love God and to love people and to follow these commands. Don't forget about the one who has blessed you. Don't think that you have accumulated all these accomplishments and all these blessings in your own power. You haven't. I'm the one who has blessed you. We need to remember the one that has shown us so much kindness, and he's given us so many physical blessings, but we're also told that through faith in Jesus, we've been given every spiritual blessing. And when we truly remember that and dwell on that, how in the world can we withhold anything from anyone in need? God has sh shown us so much kindness that he's given us his own son, Jesus, to, to live amongst us, to live the life that we could never live, to die the death that we deserve to die because of our sin. And he conquered the grave and he rose again on the third day so that through faith in Jesus, we can have a relationship with God, which God created us to have from the beginning. Titus chapter three tells us, but when the kindness and love of God, our savior appeared, that's Jesus, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. When Jesus appeared, he, he saved us, and it had nothing to do with us. It had nothing to do with how, how much good we did and how much bad we avoided. It's not about what you do or don't do. It's about what Jesus has already accomplished for us. It has absolutely nothing to do with how well you cleaned yourself up before you came to follow Jesus. It has nothing to do with how much of the Bible you know or don't know. It, it, don't know. it has everything to do with God's kindness and God's mercy. And our only proper response to that kind of love that we receive, when we dwell on it and we think about it and we remember it, is then to show that love and kindness to the world around us. When we see tangible opportunities to be able to show the kindness of God, we, in response to the kindness that we have received, give it and we give it freely. Being kind starts by recognizing God's kindness and the grace and the mercy that he has shown us. It's not enough just to know it. It's something that you have to experience for yourself. And you experience it when you come to Jesus just as you are, and you put your faith in him, and, and you experience his grace and his forgiveness. And when you experience that, and so many in this room have 
experience that, you are then gifted the gift of his Holy Spirit who partners with you to help you take your next steps of faith, to be able to intentionally practice the ways of Jesus as you grow in the characteristics that God wants you to grow in so that you can represent him well to the world around us. And as we grow more like Jesus, we're going to more naturally do the things that Jesus did. And what did Jesus do? He showed kindness to others. He even showed kindness to people that didn't really care much about Jesus, people that really had no interest in ever believing in Jesus, people who were actually bored with Jesus or maybe ignored him or even people who took advantage of him. Jesus modeled this kind of kindness toward all people. He never divided the world into these are the people that you should be kind to and these are the people that you don't be kind to the way that we do. He, he never did that. Even if he it meant that he had to have hard, difficult conversations with people, it was always motivated with kindness. He always wanted the best for them. He was always trying to reach them with God's truth, always looking for them to open up their eyes and to open up their hearts to receive what God wanted for them. He he wanted to change their hearts and to change their their minds by by looking at at the world differently than they currently were, by looking at themselves differently than they currently were, by looking at God differently than they currently were. Scripture tells us that it's the the kindness of the the Lord that leads us to repentance. And that word repentance means that the changing of mind, metanoia is the, the Greek word, We change our mind about the way that we live and the way that we are perceiving the world around us, and we see things the way that God sees them instead. And so this week, I want to encourage us as we dwell on God's grace and mercy and kindness to take our next steps of faith. And I want to encourage all of us each day uh, to read Colossians 3.12. If you don't have a Bible, we would love to gift you a Bible. We'll have a couple at the, the Welcome Center. You can download the Bible app. This is one verse that tells us that in response to God's love and mercy, that we need to daily clothe ourselves with kindness and compassion and mercy. It's this, in response to what God has done, we need to be intentional to remember that and then to live that out to the world around us, to to be reminded that God's kindness is what leads us to repentance. And then each morning, I want you to prayerfully consider what it might look like to show kindness to those around you. Perhaps at work, it would mean that you walk into the office and you have this long to-do list, but you see somebody that's struggling, and so you go over and you have a conversation with them. You, you listen, you ask questions. You, you might not be able to solve uh, their problem. You probably won't be able to solve their problem, but taking time to give up your to-do list, to, to listen and to ask questions and to show that you care can be a mark of kindness. Or maybe somebody at work has made a mistake and instead of piling on, you say, that's okay, I've made that kind of mistake too. And you empathize with them, or at least you don't make a big deal about their weaknesses. Or maybe kindness means sharing credit with people Uh, on a project that you were working on, instead of taking all the credit, making sure that people are acknowledged for the work that they have done to be able to accomplish whatever project that you're working on. You are more interested in sharing about their successes than you are your own. Maybe kindness is shown in in how you speak to others. Maybe it's an encouraging word. What if this week, before you came home and, and entered Uh, your house to to be able to interact with your family or before you walk into the the workplace, what if you just thought to yourself, what is one encouraging thing that I can say to each person? What would be good for each person to hear? You know, is there a compliment that I can pay them? Is there something that I can thank them for? Could I acknowledge the good that they have done that day? Kindness is something that should uh, really mark every single one of us as Christ followers as we look to connect our community to Christ. One of the best known early Christians was a man named Tertullian. Uh, He lived in 150 AD in what is now uh, modern day Turkey. And he said that sometimes people outside of the church would uh, mistakenly uh, call Christians people of kindness. Now, it it really was a mistake because 
uh, the language of their day, uh, the word for Christian was only one letter off from the word for someone who practiced kindness. It was Christos and Christos, right? And so it really was a mistake, but he said, maybe it wasn't a mistake. Maybe that's exactly how people should think of us who follow Christ, as people who practice kindness. Not just wishing people well, but doing people well. Like we mentioned earlier, sometimes it's easier to be kind to those who are strangers than it is to those that we're closest to. But, but I think that God would be pleased if we, as a, a, a church, if we would start with those who are closest to us, our spouses, our kids, our, our families, our, our, our church. And then if we went out into our, our workplace and our, our neighborhoods and our, our community as a whole and, and the, the world around us, and we showed the kindness of God to them. And so my prayer this week as a, a church is that we, every single one of us individually, uh, would be reminded, we would take time to be reminded of God's kindness that God has shown us through his son, Jesus, and the sacrifice that he has made for us, that, that God has given us every spiritual blessing and that we would put kindness uh, and, and uh, intentionally put kindness uh, as a habit that we're going to practice every single day, that we would take time to receive God's love and to be so thankful for it that we couldn't help but then show it to the world around us. This is so important. In, in today's culture, when the climate is so harsh and unkind, cruel even, it's so important that we as Christ followers, as ambassadors of Jesus, the, the, the one who is so kind, that we make sure that we remember that kindness really is the key. Let's pray to that end. God, we do thank you that Scripture tells us that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. God, we thank you that you have shown us great kindness by giving us your son, Jesus, who lived the life we could never live, who died the death that we deserve, but he rose and conquered the grave. And when we put our faith in him, our life is forever changed. We experience that grace, but we are also gifted the Holy Spirit. So now we can represent you well to the world around us. Forgive us, God, for the moments that we haven't represented you well when we rely on our own strength and our own power instead of partnering with your Holy Spirit to be able to be ambassadors to the community around us, looking to connect those who are far from you with you so that they too can experience this life-changing grace. And so I pray that this week that we would take some time to remember your, your goodness and your grace and your mercy, your kindness, and then we would be very intentional about how we can show kindness to the people that we're closest to and even those that are strangers. God, I pray that we would be marked as people of kindness and as we share the life-changing truth of, of uh, your son, Jesus Christ, I pray that the kindness that we show them would help in them receiving that and experiencing it for themselves. Thank you for the privilege of representing you well. We thank you that kindness is the key. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.